Hi everyone, this is a quick lecture on the group project or the final project for econometrics. I uh, just want to give you a sense of uh, what's going on in this and how to do it. So this project is, uh, is about running a hedonic regression and uh, basically taking, it, it's taking a, a problem set and turning it into something that um, is useful for uh, somebody who's, a, who's your employer. Your employer is not going to want to see uh, regression output and um, they're going to want to uh, know how to interpret the regression output and what it means for their company. Um, so that's what this is about. I want you to think of this as uh, a bit more than just a, a problem set. I want you to think of this as I'm handing you a data set I'm not going to give you R script for this um, because I want you, you now have enough R script in your sort of R script arsenal from all the problem sets uh, to do this entire thing. Um, so you have to actually write your own code to do this analysis. Um, and then I want you to um, answer the questions like you would uh, um, for somebody who doesn't know how to read R script. Um, so you're running what's called a hedonic regression. Hedonic regressions are simply a, a funny way of saying you put the price on the left-hand side of the equation. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to decompose the price of something. In this case, it's uh, varieties of wine. We're trying to figure out what fraction of the price of wine can be explained by uh, variety or um, how many cases are sold or how what the age of the wine is we can do this for anything often one of the most common uh examples of hedonic regression is housing prices um, real estate companies use this all the time to try to figure out uh, what predicts housing prices and you can think of you know having a uh, number of bedrooms in your model so an additional bedroom would increase the price of a house on average by x percent or x dollars so that's what a hedonic regression is it's, it's just a, a funny way of saying we put the price on the left hand side of the equation and we're trying to and we regress price on uh, the product attributes or the attributes of the house or the attributes of the, of the wine in this case um, we often call the the attributes the the coefficients on the attributes um so i'm right here um we call these marginal effects the implicit prices so if if we have um if price is the uh, price of a house and we have number of bedrooms for example on the right hand side of our equation um, the coefficient is going to be the implicit price of a bedroom. So how much people are willing to pay for a bedroom in a house. It's kind of a funny thing to think about at first. How much are, is somebody willing to pay for a bedroom? Um, but the neat thing about this is we can use it to value out attributes that don't normally have a price. So obviously we don't we can't go out and buy bedrooms. But um, there's other things that are also really interesting like um, views of... Uh, in, in Fort Collins, maybe views of the, uh, the foothills. So we can value the, uh, how much people are willing to pay to have a view of the foothills. We can value how much people are willing to pay to um, have access to the foothills, you know, access to nature. So we can, um, we can even use these models if we have um, different locations in a city or something to value uh, to see how much people are willing to pay to, to live uh, away from crime or um, to live uh, not near polluted areas, and et cetera. So there's kind of interesting ways we could use these hedonic regressions. Um, another example might be the price of a car on the characteristics of the car. We could see how much people are willing to pay for a trunk or uh, or sorry, that's a truck uh, versus a, a different type of car for uh, four doors versus two doors for four wheel drive for the make of the car for the model of the car. Um, we can have all kinds of things in the model. Something a little more relevant for the agricultural uh, 
students. We might have the price of beef on the left hand side or the price of a cow. We can have characteristics of a cow on the right hand side or um, the characteristic, characteristics of the, the cut of beef so we could control for the, the cut and um, have a dummy variable if it's prime, if it's organic, if it's grass fed. Um, I have brown cow in there. Um, let's see. Dummy variables. Um, so, so far in our models, we've included a dummy variable for uh, things like gender, like male versus female. Um, in this in this group project, you're going to have uh, multiple dummy variables. So, you're going to have dummy variables for uh, different varieties of wine. And this is what I'm doing here is just going to show you how to interpret the coefficients on those uh, multiple dummy variables. So if you have um, two varieties of, let's see, our example is um, we have three types of cattle and we want to see which type sells for a premium, regular, organic, or grass fed. And we're going to have dummy variables for each. How do you interpret the dummy variables? Um, so in this case, we can only include two of these categories. We have, if these are mutually exclusive, so um, if there's only three types of cattle, regular, organic, and grass-fed, we can only include two of the dummy variables in the model. And let's suppose we include organic and grass-fed. So the, the way to interpret the coefficients on organic and grass-fed would then be um, the effect of organic relative to regular versus the effect of grass-fed relative to regular. So it's always the interpretation of the coefficients are going to be relative to the left out coefficient or the left out uh, variable. And this is uh, relevant for, um, for the project because I ask you this explicitly in one of the questions. Um, so uh, here we, why were, so here in question one part, uh, B, why were the dummy variables for generic California and Zinfandel omitted? Uh, so let's go back up and look at what the dummy variables are. We have regional dummy variables, Napa Valley, Bay Area, Sonoma, uh, Sierra, Mendocino, and we're omitting the generic California. So this is a dummy variable indicating if a wine came from Napa Valley, the Bay Area, Sonoma, or Sierra, or Mendocino Lake. And the omitted category is everywhere else in generic in California. So uh, the interpretation of the Napa Valley coefficient would be the price premium for Napa Valley wines relative to California, generic California wines. The, the interpretation of the Bay, Bay Area coefficient would be the price premium relative or the price premium for Bay Area wines relative to other generic California wines. Uh, this would be the price premium uh, for Sonoma wines relative to generic California, etc. And then we have, we also have uh, grape variety dummy variables. So non varietal, uh, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, these are all different types of grapes uh, used to make wine. The left out category is Zinfandel. So the interpretation of each of the coefficients on these in any of your models would be relative to the left out category. So this is obviously assuming you're including all of the dummy variables in the model. So if we had Pinot Noir in the, uh, in the regression, then the coefficient on Pinot Noir would be the effect of Pinot Noir on prices relative to Zinfandel or the, uh, addition, the price premium for Pinot Noir relative to Zinfandel. And this could be positive or negative. If Pinot Noir sells for less than Zinfandel, then this is going to be negative. If Pinot Noir uh, sells for more than Zinfandel on average, then it's going to be positive. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the um, the project and just give you some tips on how to uh, how to how to complete it. Uh, originally, I had this on the website or on Canvas as uh, as an Excel project um, that was from last year. I just updated that, so now everything should be done in R. Um, so here we have in, in your data when you download it, you're going to have price prices, cases, score, um, all the variables that you see here, all the dummy variables as well. 
we just talked about which dummy variables are excluded so that you won't have these in your in your data set but that just means that those are the emitted categories so um, there are uh, generic California wines in your data but they're uh, they, if it's a generic California wine it's going to be zero for all of these uh, variables here if it's a Zinfandel it's going to be zero for all of the uh, grape varietal dummy variables Okay, so you're going to import the data. Uh, before starting the analysis, elaborate on the possible uses of the hedonic model. So just think about um, what we, we what I was talking about a minute ago. Um, what can you use a hedonic model for when prices are on the left-hand side? You can use it for just about anything that has a price uh, in order to decompose the price of the product you're, you're thinking about. Uh, comment on the rationale for including all the variables in the model. Um, uh, calculate some summary statistics. Uh, so we've done all this before. <coughs> create some scatter plots, create a histogram. So let's take a look at an R script um, to do this. So here I've created uh, a basic R script from the previous problem sets. So I always want to clear my workspace. I've just cleared my workspace, get my working directory, set my working directory to the place where I've saved the data. I'm going to import some packages or uh, take bring them in from the library, then read in the data. So now uh, here's an important thing that um, some people have had trouble with. The data needs to be read in using the read RDS function here. So you have to use this function to, in order to read the data in, or you get the, the error magic number X missing or whatever it is. Um, so you have to know where you have saved the data. You have to know your working directory, your path to the data. And then every time you refer to the data, um, this is the name of the data you that you're referring to. So you, when you read the data in, you have to call it something. So I could call the data um, something like rainy day. So I could, I could call the data rainy day and it shows up over here, rainy day. It's the same data. So here, let's take a look at the data. Here's when I called it data. Here's when I called it rainy day. It's the exact same data. Notice you have an ID in the data. This is, you don't need to include this in your analyses. Okay, so I've called, I've called the data something. Let's go back and call it data because that's just, that makes more sense. So I'm going to call the data something. I call it data. Data is equal to the read in the project data. So now I'm going to uh, attach the data set, meaning that I'm telling R, this is the data set I want to use most of the time. So attach the data. Uh, and then I'm going to create some histograms. Now notice that the price variable has a capital P. If I put histogram, histogram of price with a lowercase p, I'm going to get an error. So you see that object price is not found. Now let me try it with a, uh, a capital P. There, it worked. So that's just a little note on make sure you, um, you know what the variable is actually called. The capital P makes a difference. We could also if we hadn't attached the data, or even if we have, we can tell R what data set we're trying to uh, reference here. So we could go data dollar sign, which means we're going to the, the data data set. It's kind of redundant, but data uh, and go to the price variable. So let me do that. I do that and I get the exact same thing. Okay, so we uh, 
we wanted to uh, create some histograms of price. We want to create some scatter plots. We want to describe the data. We know how to describe the data. We've done that before. Um, let's quickly look at that. Uh, I have that down here. Describe, we have to use the library, uh, the package psych, and then we can describe the data. And we get a nice table that gives us uh, the mean of every variable, the standard deviation, the median, etc. Uh, so let's plot some of the, the things. Well, we know the plot command. We've seen this before. We're going to plot cases and price. Make sure you change the title. <coughs> Make sure you change the X labels and the Y labels every time you uh, create a plot. So let's do that. Here's what we get. Um, looks like a nice plot of prices and cases. Um, so you're going to have to do that for uh, several different variables. We want to plot prices versus cases, prices versus score, and prices versus age. Make sure you change the title and the, uh, the labels of the axes every time you do that. Um, now we create, we estimate some linear models. So let me estimate the, uh, the linear model with uh, price, not log price. So here we include all variables except, of course, ID. ID isn't really, is kind of pointless. So here I've included all variables in the model. You can see what variables you have. If you expand this, here's the variables I have in my data. So I included all of these in the model. Estimate it, Let's see what we get. So I'm calling the output of this model linear hedonic. I'm going to summarize the linear hedonic and get some coefficient estimates. So here we have, this tells us what our model is, uh, gives us some information about the residuals, the coefficient estimates, their standard errors, their t-value, <coughs> t-values and their, their p-values, t-statistics and p-values. Um, we also get the R squares down at the bottom and the overall F statistic for um, the, the whole model. So this says that, um, for example, cases have a neg uh, an additional case sold as a negative effect on prices, but it's statistically insignificant at the 95% level. Or we fail to reject a null hypothesis that this coefficient is equal to zero. So in the, in the linear model, cases doesn't really seem to have an effect. Um, score, uh, this is a, a score for the wine, how uh, some people have reviewed the wine. Um, the score has a positive effect on the price of wine. Not surprising, higher scores, it's going to sell for a premium. And this appears to be statistic, statistically significant. Um, and then we have some, uh, our, our dummy variables, so let's, Let's maybe take a look at these ones. These are the, the, the grape varieties. So we have non-varietals, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Merlot, Syrah. Um, we can see these are dummy variables if we just take a look at the data set. Uh, you can see all of these are either zero or one. Same with the, the grape varietals. Shouldn't be anything in here except zeros and ones. All right, so how do we interpret these? The non-varietals, what does this say? It says the non-varietal uh, sells for a premium of $20 relative to the generic uh, or the Zinfandel. I think the Zinfandel was the left out grape variety. So if, if prices are measured in dollars, this is a $20 premium for non-varietals. So that's pretty high. Uh, Cabernet sells for a $12 premium relative to Zinfandel. Merlot sells for a $7 premium relative to Zinfandel, and Syrah sells, does not sell for a premium relative to Zinfandel. Um, all of these would be relative to the generic California uh, location. None of these seem to be um, sell for a premium relative to the gen generic California in this model. Okay, then I ask you to, um, so, uh, you have to comment on the model fit, you have to comment on the F statistic, you have to comment on irrelevant variables, meaning they are not statistically significant. Then I ask you, why were the dummy variables omitted? 
uh, well, if we included if we included all of the dummy variables, then there would be multicollinearity, uh, perfect multicollinearity. In fact, it'd be like including a dummy for male and a dummy for female. We have to omit one, uh, and if we omitted it, so in the grape variety example, um, we've omitted uh, Zinfandel. If we omitted a different variety then the interpretation of the coefficient on the variables would be uh, relative to whatever variety we had omitted. So if we, if we include Zinfandel instead of Merlot, for example, the coefficient on Zinfandel would be the effect, the price premium for Zinfandel relative to Merlot. So uh, that's the answer to that question. Okay, obtain the residuals and the predicted values from the linear model. Now we've done this before, um, and typically, okay, we create the predicted values first. Uh, we've done this by, um, I wanted to, in the past I wanted you to do, do this by hand so you knew what you were doing. Uh, there are actually commands for this, I'll show you in one second, but in the past what we were doing is we were taking cases, uh, well first we would, we would take the intercept, add the coefficient on cases times cases, add the coefficient on score times score plus coefficient on age times age. Um, so we, we could do this manually uh, to create the predicted values, um, but this is a lot of coefficients now. So let's just use uh, this command called predict. So we've called our linear hedonic model lin head. Um, we can create residuals, residuals being y minus y hat, predicted values being the y hats. Uh, we create residuals just by running this command called resid of the linear hedonic model. So we run that. We get, it shows up over here. We get residuals. Uh, we can create the predicted values. And then we can pr plot the predicted versus the residuals. And we get this. Um, next up, we... Um, we're going to estimate a log linear model. So this is not logging all of the variables in the model. You couldn't log all the variables on the right hand side because you have variables that, the dummy variables that only take on the values 0 and 1. What's the log of 0? It's negative infinity. Uh, so that doesn't work. So the log linear model is just logging prices and everything else on the right hand side remains linear. So we're going to do this, comment on the overall significance of the model, just like before, interpret the coefficients, um, then obtain the predicted values again, uh, and the residuals, and plot them, and then interpret the, the coefficient. So uh, let, me, let me create the logged price variable. So I'm going to log, add a new variable to the data set, log price equals the log of price done. Estimate a log linear hedonic model where I now have, it's exactly the same as the model up here except now the left hand side variable is the log of price rather than price. So let me estimate this model. Summarize it. And now these coefficients look a little different. <coughs> Why do they look different? Because remember uh, these are going to be interpreted as, as uh, Percent, percent changes uh, because y is now, or prices are now logged. So we're talking about a one unit change in age causing, a, uh, in this case, an 18% change in prices. Um, we can then get the residuals again, the predicted values, and then plot them. There we go these look a bit different. The residuals against the predicted values look a bit different. The previous one looked a little more heteroscedastic. This looks uh, maybe a little more homoscedastic. So we're doing better. Another thing to notice is that all of the coefficients are now, uh, the, their statistical significance is much higher. Um, we get two to three stars pretty much everywhere. And the F statistic is much higher than it was before. The R squared is much higher than it was before. I'm giving you some hints that the log linear model is the better model. Um, 
So interpret the coefficients. I, I already interpreted the coefficient on age for you. Um, the marginal effects in the log linear model are calculated as dy dx equals the beta <coughs> beta xk or beta k times uh, the y value. In this case, you could plug in the average y. Really what this is saying is that, okay, so if, let's look at, um, let's look at uh, one of these values. So um, Merlot. Merlot has a coefficient of 0.28 relative to the admitted category, category of Zinfandel. So this says that Merlot sells for a premium of 28% higher than Zinfandel. Um, that's quite a premium. What is that in terms of dollars? Well, it's 28% times the mean of price. So the, uh, the price, of, uh, price of Y, Y is price. So it would be taking the coefficient multiplying by uh, the mean of Y. So that would convert the percentage into dollars. Um, so you can get the, the beta K straight from the log linear model. And that would be 28% for price premium for Merlot relative to Zinfandel. But to convert that to dollars, you just multiply it by average prices. Um, So this is asking you to do basically what I was just saying. Um, find the price premium from Napa Valley relative to Zinfandel. Find the, find the price premium for Sonoma. You're in this pretending to work for Napa Valley. So they, they're primarily interested in their own wines. They want to know, do they sell at a price premium? Um, you can also, I also ask you to try some other nonlinear functions. Think about what you, in the, with these variables, what makes the most sense? Um, do you think that um, age should be squared or the, the effect of age is nonlinear? Maybe uh, an additional year, uh, as, the, as the wine gets older, the price goes up, but maybe at a, at a de decreasing rate, or maybe it's actually going up at an increasing rate, so at a squared term. Just come up with some reason to add some other nonlinear nonlinearities to the model. Um, do you expect there to be multi multicollinearity? Um, so, in order to uh, figure out if there's multicollinearity or if it's a problem, you're going to have to uh, uh, find the correlation in the data. So, uh, to do that, you can just run this, uh, these lines here. Let me do this. I actually don't have this in the, in the script. Let me put in my, the name of my data. I don't want those in there. All right. So, so this is the correlation matrix is equal to correlation of data. Run that. And I get a correlation matrix down here. Um, so this is telling you, uh, this is quite large. All right, so you'll see down the diagonal here, uh, we get ones, meaning the correlation between ID and ID is one, 100%. Obviously, the correlation be between price and price is one. The correlation between cases and cases is one. But what we're really interested in is the correlation between cases and prices. So in that case, it's negative 0.1 cases and prices here. The correlation goes, correlation of X and Y is the same, same as correlation of Y and X. So the, um, the, this is just reflected on itself. Um, so look for situations where we have high levels of correlation. Um, log price and price doesn't count, um, but if multicollinearity would be a place where the correlation is nearing one or negative one, and it, we're not talking about cases against cases, so variables against other variables is what we're interested in. And then you have to uh, do a little bit of a prediction exercise. 
uh, using the results to um, help the owner of Napa Valley uh, think about what they should sell their, their wine at, what price they should sell their wine at. Um, I'll leave that up to you. And I think that should give you enough information to complete this group project. Good luck.